I, I feel that it is my duty to ask this question now that we're at March 10th. How many days of the year have we been through now? Are we getting close to 70 or 70? Eh, we're not 75 yet. Some 60, some 70 days of the year. How's those New Year's resolutions working out? Um, would you like a changed life? It's, a, it's an interesting question to think about, right? Uh, that so many of us would love if our lives changed in some respect, some aspect of our lives, be it finances or health or relationships, diet, appearance, projects, improvement projects usually. Those are some of the things that go into New Year's resolutions around the house or self-improvement projects or hobbies. We're going to start something new, right? Right? I think, you know, walk into any bookstore today and you're going to find a number of books about how to change your life. And there's a whole segment of those books that, like, if you buy the book today on Sunday, your life can be changed by Friday, right? Like, that fast. Just read this book, that simple, and there'll be some new change in your life, right? And the fact that every single year on January 1st, so many of us set out with these resolutions of things we want to change, thinking that somehow magically going from December 31st to January 1 is going to result in this dramatic change, the fact that so many of us desire that change and come up with those resolutions, it it speaks to the fact, it points to the fact that deep, deep inside of us, many of us know Our lives, we would like change in some aspect. We would like if things were different. Well, this morning as we go through John chapter 4, you're going to see Jesus interact with this woman at Samaria. And she's by a well, and her and Jesus have this interaction. And what you're going to see is Jesus speak to the fact that her life needs to change. And if she understood who who he was her life would result in dramatic change. So here's the lesson that you and I need as we come through this passage of Scripture this morning. If you're taking notes, you can write down. Here's our one thing this morning. As we look at this passage, discover Jesus Christ, and you discover someone who will change your life. Discover Jesus Christ, and you discover someone who will change your life. I'm going to read through the passage of Scripture, and you're going to hear this interaction of Jesus talking with this woman. And I I want you to see some of the areas in her life that Jesus points to that will change. But here's what I want you to get. And I want you to think about this, that, that if Jesus changes our life as his followers, here's what that means. It means that our lives change now and in the future. And I want you to catch that Jesus' point with this woman was that her life would change now, in the present reality, here and now. And here's the reason I point that out. Because I think it's very easy in the church today to think of salvation or a relationship with Jesus Christ or a changed life as a future thing that will happen someday in eternity because Christians go to heaven, right? And we think, well, that's, that's the future change that is involved with following Christ, and someday I'll have a mansion, and I'll walk streets of gold, and I know that there will be change in the future. And here's one of the things that begins to happen if we buy into that line of thinking. We forget that Jesus came, and his, the change he desired to bring changes our life right now. Mm. It's great to have a few of the college kids home. We've got high schoolers scattered throughout the auditorium, some even in junior high, and I want to speak to you for just a second because what I want you to know and to think and to realize, right, is that if you're going to be a Christian and follow Jesus Christ, your life begins to look different right now. And and it's easy at your age to think, well, you know, four, five, six decades from now, when I'm closer to meeting Jesus, then I will be glad my life is going to change. But that's not the invitation that Jesus gives to come to him and to know that he will change our lives because the change begins to work right now here in the present. And yes, we look forward to a future change when we're with Christ in all of his glory in heaven. But the change begins now. 
So let's begin to look at it. Let's look at John chapter 4. Let me read this whole interaction. It's very long, but I want you to get to this story. We're going to go down through about verse 42, okay? And let's read it together uh, and listen as I read as Jesus interacts with this woman. I want you to hear the whole thing because from here on out, I'm just going to have to summarize and pick different phrases as we go through it. So listen to what happens. John chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him. And he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying I have no husband, for you have had five husbands. The one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to Him, I know that Messiah is coming, He who is called Christ. When He comes, He will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am He. Just then, his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, What do you seek? Or, Why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him something to eat? And Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that town believed to him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It's no longer because of what you have said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. This is the word of the Lord as we look at this passage. 
as we understand what Jesus did here with this woman in Samaria, you, you notice how her life instantly, she realizes who Jesus is, and her life changes to the point that now this woman goes and tells people about Jesus, and they come, and many of them believe, and their lives are also going to result in change. So what does this passage mean? How does it apply to our lives as we understand, okay, why is it that when you discover Jesus Christ, you discover someone who changes your life, and how does that start now? It's both now and future. I want to unpack some of this and help us understand it. And by the way, we're only going to get through about half of what I read. I wanted you to hear the whole story to see how not just this woman's life changes, but many others change as well. But we're going to stop around verse 26. Lord willing, next week, one of our elders, Al Graber, is going to finish the chapter for us uh, at the end of the chapter. Some of what I skip over, we may come back and pick up another week. Uh, But I, I want you just to hear a little bit of this first part about Jesus changing this woman's life and why he says that change is important. When you think about Jesus' interaction with the woman at the well here in Samaria, it teaches us a lot about who God is, but the story at first glance seems very disconnected. In what I read to you, if you were paying attention, think about it, and it feels like it jumps around in some pretty weird ways, right? Jesus and this woman meet at a well, and they seem like they're thirsty, but pretty soon they start talking about living water, And it's clear they're having a miscommunication about what kind of water because Jesus is talking about spiritual water and she just thinks he's thirsty and wants physical water, right? And from there, the, the story turns and changes and starts talking about her husband and how many husbands she has. And why, how did we get from water to husbands? And did you notice the next change? They start talking about worship and where worship happens. Why? And by the way, Jesus is in Samaria, this northern part of the region, and likely very close to Mount Gerizim, where the Samaritans would have said, this is the mountain we worship at. But what did the Jews believe? They believed the center of worship and where the temple was located was in Jerusalem. So how do they go from talking about water to husbands to worship? It seems super disconnected. And the more you look at it, and as we study it, and as you learn what it is that God wants us to have, you'll see that Jesus, knowing the hearts of all people, he weaves this all together. All three themes are intricately connected. And we'll understand something for our lives and how our lives are intended to change. So we're going to look at three aspects of who God is. Three aspects of what God expects and desires for us. And as we go through the passage, don't think of these three points or these three aspects as all sequential, meaning it's not like the first thing we're going to learn about God is in the first couple verses and the second thing in the middle verses and the third thing at the end. Rather, they all kind of overlap. It's like we're going to comb through the story three times and pull on a different thread each time, and you're going to see this new aspect of God and our relationship with God, right? So let's look at this. Here's three things we can learn about God, about our relationship with God. And the first is the heart of God. I want you to notice the heart of God in this passage as he ministers to this woman. The text points several things out for us. It lets us know that this happened about the sixth hour in verse 6. One of the things that's interesting there is that this woman is... um, when, I, when I'm referring to the heart of God, what I want you to catch is that God's compassionate heart crosses all boundaries to minister to this woman. There's a gender boundary that's at play. There's a racial boundary that's at play. There's even something of a societal class boundary that's at play. And I want you to see that Jesus transcends or crosses all those barriers because his heart is so compassionate and loving. So this happens about the sixth hour, which would have been at noon, and likely the reason, as you hear about this woman in her marriages, you realize when she says, I have no husband, the the only way she could still be a respectable woman of society and have no husband is if she's a widow, but that's clearly not the case, right? She's, She's had five husbands. And the, 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 the reality is that the person she's with now is not her husband. And this isn't because of death. It's because of divorce. It's because of an immoral lifestyle. And, 
And yet here's Jesus talking to this woman, and he crosses that boundary. Now, one thing that you need to keep in mind, a respectable Jew, and Jesus being a teacher at this point, people referring to him as rabbi, uh, someone of that class would not talk to a woman that was a stranger, certainly not in public. It wouldn't happen, and Jesus does that. So Jesus crosses the gender boundary there to realize this this woman, this daughter of God, made in the image of God, in a patriarchal society, that wouldn't have happened. It does for Jesus because he knows people, he loves people, he goes towards people, right? But secondly, there's a racial boundary. Jews did not like Samaritans. They had no dealings with Samaritans. The text tells you that Jesus had to go through Samaria. He's wrapped up some ministry that was taking place in the, in the region of Judea, closer to Jerusalem. And now he's going to begin some ministry here for a couple of stories in Samaria. So Samaria was this northern part of the region, and good Jews did not go to, Jama- to Samaria. They didn't like each other. They hated each other. But if you needed to get to the northern region, the quickest way was to go right through Samaria. Now, there were some that would bypass and take the long route because they didn't want to go through Samaria. But Jesus here is willing to go right through. And he meets this woman at this well in the middle of the day. It was more common for women to come in groups early in the morning, so they avoided the heat of the day. And yet Jesus is willing to talk to a Samaritan. Jesus' disciples are willing to go into town and buy food. There are some strict Jews who would never do that. You have to go through Samaria, you pack your own lunch. But Jesus desired to have a ministry, and he wasn't going to be held in check by some of those social customs of the day, even if his disciples didn't fully understand and were even questioning why was he there. But do you see Jesus' heart that he's willing to talk to this woman who had no dealings with Jews, and yet Jesus does. And when you take Jesus ministering to the Samaritan woman, and you kind of compare it and contrast it with what we looked at a couple weeks ago of Jesus and Nicodemus, do you remember Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews? He came to Jesus by night. And I I want you to see what you're dealing with. Nicodemus on this hand and the Samaritan woman on this hand, right? Nicodemus is a leader. Nicodemus is educated. He is a man. He is powerful. He's a Jew. And yet, what does Jesus say? He needs to be born again. And here's the Samaritan woman. She's a foreigner. She's an outcast. She's a woman of no social standing to have importance. And you see John arranging both stories. Both their lives need to change. They're both on equal footing before the cross. And you see the heart of God, that that God goes to this woman and he's going to minister, right? And I want you to know if you are here this morning and if, if you need a relationship with God, which is all of us in the room, God's heart is for us. God's heart is towards us. God's love knows no boundaries in that sense. It is not as if you have to be good before God will come to you. You do not earn and work your way to God. It's a gift. That's what Jesus says. If you knew the gift of God, you would ask and I would give living water. It's a gift. You cannot earn it. It must be given, right? And that's God's heart for us. By the way, if you're truly a Christian and you know and understand the gospel, that will be the same way you treat others. That will be the way we treat other people that that our heart goes to others regardless of their class, their standing. One of the things that makes the church so unique is that we find our common identity in who Christ is, and it gives us a mutual brotherhood, right? That you see people from all walks of life come together because God's heart has been for us, and so we ought to have our hearts for others. So that's the heart of God, but I want you to see not only the heart of God, I want you to see the salvation of God. What is it that Jesus is offering with this living water? Let's look a little bit at the text here, and I want you to see this like in verses 10 and 11. Jesus answered her and says, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked, and he would have given you living water. What does Jesus mean by living water? He's offering salvation at this point, but the woman doesn't know it. It goes right over her head. Because you see it in her response in the next verse. And she says, wait a minute, 
you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where does this living water come from? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He's the one who gave us the well, right? Now, why this misunderstanding? Jesus is talking about one thing, and it goes right over her head. Why? There's a couple of things that are taking place here. When Jesus uses the term for living water, the word living, it can be, uh, it's, it's as opposed to stagnant water, right? And a couple of the words in the text even help us understand the difference between just stagnant water and running water. And what is likely taking place here, one of the words that's used is a well that's actually a spring-fed well, right? That there's a trickling source of running water, and yet this was also a well that was dug deep like a cistern. And what likely happened as the well was dug out and it was deep, it was still spread by fed by a spring at the bottom, but you had some way to get that running water out. And so when Jesus says, I have living water, she thinks, yeah, I know there's running water at the bottom of the well, but you have, how are you going to get that out, right? And yet Jesus isn't talking about running water. He's talking about water that's alive. He's talking in a spiritual sense. He's using a spiritual metaphor to talk about living water, water that will bring eternal life. Throughout the rest of the gospel, you're going to hear a few of these different metaphors, right? That Jesus is the bread of life, that Jesus is the light of the world. Well, here, he's living water, and she doesn't catch it. It it goes right over her head. And part of what Jesus is referring to would have been common in Old Testament scriptures, you can go back through some, several of the prophets in many, many places, and you will see living water referred to as a promise of God for his people. And as his people, the Israelites, were waiting for one day this Messiah to come to bring change, to, to enact everything that they were missing, living water was often associated with these promises. Pastor Kevin read one of them at the call to worship to open our service. And I just want to read again verse 1 of Isaiah chapter 55. And here's what the text says. Isaiah 55, 1. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come by and eat. You see, you see, uh, Jesus is referring not just to water that runs like a spring. He's talking about the fulfillment of promise where, where living water would come and it would address the people's truest, most deep spiritual needs. And as he has this interaction, Jesus says every, in verse 13, everyone who drinks of this water... And, and, and you can almost, the word this is there, as if there's a comparison and contrast. If you drink of this water out of this well, you, you're going to be thirsty again. Even Jacob was thirsty when he drank out of this well. You want to know if I'm greater than Jacob? Yes, I am. That's what Jesus says. You drink out of this, you're going to be thirsty again. But I'm talking about living water. Now, being a Samaritan, she wouldn't have been familiar with those Old Testament prophets. She would have relied on just the first five books of the Old Testament. But Jesus knew where the true promise would come from. And that's why he points to it. And he he says in verse 14 that it would be waters that would spring up to eternal life. And when the woman hears that in verse 15, give me that water. I want that, she says. Uh, But do you notice why? Her motivation is still off. She says, I'll take that living water, then I don't have to come here and keep drawing. This is a chore. This is a hassle. She's still not getting it. And so Jesus asks her to call her husband. And you and I are sitting here saying, whoa, whoa, curveball. Why jump there? And Jesus points out the fact that he he goes to this question, bring your husband. She says, I have no husband. She, She knows her backstory. She knows her shame. Here's this Jew talking to her. And if she has to share her deepest scars and war stories. She will be exposed for the fraud that she is. I have no husband. She hopes he moves on. He doesn't move on. He says, you're exactly right. And and he points out the number of marriages. He points out that she's currently living with a man who's not her husband. And what is Jesus doing? Well, catch this. He's not being rude. He's not being demeaning. He is not exposing her as a fraud. He's compassionately drawing her to the living water. Catch it and see it. And it's connected to those Old Testament 
promises of living water. I want you to see Jesus is saying, you want the living water? This is the path. I'm going to show you how to get there, but first we need to deal with your need. She thinks she has merely a physical thirst, and Jesus says, no, no, no. There is a spiritual thirst of far greater importance, and the fact that you've had so many husbands points to it, and he's going to go right after her need and her sin, and this is what every Old Testament promise of living water points to over and over we can look at the old testament passages and it talks about not just living water but sin that needs to be dealt with isaiah chapter 55 was what we started with in the call to worship isaiah 55 is what uh i just referenced come everyone who's thirsty after condemning the people because they're spending their money on things that won't satisfy, there's again this promise, right? And look at verse 5. Here's here's the promise that continues in Isaiah 55, verse 5. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know. A nation that did not know you shall run to you. Keep track of that later on in the interaction about worship. He's going to say, you worship what you don't know. We do know, right? Right? And here's this outsider, this woman, this woman from Samaria, who who Jesus is going to openly tell that he's the living water. And look at verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Do you catch what happens when people are supposed to come for the living water? They must turn from their wicked way. They have to forsake the sins that don't satisfy. They're buying bread in the wrong places. And Jesus says, if you want the living water, forsake the wicked way. This comes up in a bunch of these Old Testament promises that that the living water is connected to the forsaking of sin. Jeremiah chapter 2. Let me read Jeremiah chapter 2, starting in verse 13. And here's how it's put here. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. What did God's people do? They wouldn't come to the fountain of living water. Over and over they rebelled against God, and they, they, they would think they were finding their own sources of water, but they were broken. They could never provide. And over and over they're condemned for that. They're indicted for that. This woman is just one more example in a long list of human beings that look for life in the wrong places. All of us do this. Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 13, verse 1. On that day, there shall be a house opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Why? To cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. Why does Jesus ask about her husband? He's not trying to be rude. He's not trying to shame her. He's trying to say, do you want living water? We must first deal with sin. For that is, Jesus came in order to deal with sin. Jesus' death on the cross, what we're going to remember around the table this morning, we are proclaiming the fact that Christ's body was broken, his blood was shed. Why? As payment for the forgiveness of sins. Because all of us, we could go through the room And though this woman, her issue was five husbands plus one that wasn't a husband. Well, you and I could all have equally embarrassing, equally guilt-inducing, equally penalty of sin exposing stories written of our life. And in order to come to the living water, to have this fountain of cleansing water poured out over our lives. Our sins must be dealt with. How does that happen? It happens through faith and repentance. Coming to God and realizing I'm a sinner. My own righteousness can't save me. Uh, Going to church won't save me. Being baptized won't save me. There's nothing I can do to clean up my life to work my way into salvation. 
It's only through what Jesus Christ has done. And we must come to the end of ourselves and realize that I'm a sinner who needs Jesus and what he did on the cross saves me. And from that point forward, there's a marked change in our life where we repent of our sins, where we turn and go the other direction. And Jesus points out her sin because she has to deal with it. He doesn't just say, here, come to me, pray this prayer, and you will have living water. And hopefully, maybe someday, you'll figure out that the person you're living with is a problem. Jesus doesn't do that. He addresses it head on, right away from the get-go. Because if you're going to believe who Jesus is, he says that he's the Lord of our lives, and we must turn from the sin that he says he will save us from. This doesn't mean we instantly become perfect Christians. It doesn't mean you have to become perfect to become God's child. It does mean that you turn from your sin and you run to Christ. Have you done that? Have you, have you trusted in Christ for salvation, realizing that your life is the sinful thing that must be turned from? The sinful thing that Jesus is saving you from? That's what he offers this woman here. Now, when Jesus points out her sin, here's the third thing that I want us to look at. The worship of God. How is the worship of God connected to this? When Jesus points out this woman's sin, she again changes the subject. Now, perhaps this is a sidestep maneuver, or she's saying, whoa, wait a minute. I'm realizing some pretty significant spiritual things are going on. Maybe you're even the prophet. Um, go ahead and solve this debate between Jews and Samaritans. Now, Understanding where the Samaritans came from helps us a little bit, and there's some debates about where the Samaritans came from, but they were in this northern region of the land, and several centuries before the time of Christ, when, when uh, God's people were taken captive and carried off into uh, captivity, there was a group there of Israelites that were left in the northern land. And lots of foreigners were brought in so that they would intermarry and mix religions. And over the centuries, that's who the Samaritans are. They were spiritual half-breeds in the Jews' eyes. They were people of Jewish origins who went after other gods. And, and uh, yet they sincerely wanted to follow God. They, they, they looked to the first five books of the Old Testament and thought that was going to be their access to God, and they picked the place of Mount Gerizim. That's what they thought God had pointed out. And so when they worshipped, they did it at Mount Gerizim. A couple centuries before the time of Christ, Jews went up and burned their temple down. You can imagine why racial hostilities were so tense, right? And she says, all right, we've been fighting about this for centuries. Is it Mount Gerizim or is it Jerusalem? And here's what Jesus points out. Why is he talking about worship now, right? Jesus says, listen, okay, at this moment, yes, it really is Jerusalem. You, do, you don't know. You, you worship what you don't know. Let me see if I can find the verse for you here of where I'm at, what I'm trying to summarize in John chapter 4. Uh, I'm, I'm around 21, 22, these verses here. And Jesus says, at this moment, you, you don't worship what you know. We Jews do know. Salvation does come from the Jews. It really is Jerusalem at this moment. But he says, the hour is coming. In fact, it's now here. It's going to make all of this obsolete. This centuries-old argument won't matter anymore. Why? Remember that the hour in John, we looked at this a couple of weeks ago, when John uses the phrase the hour, he is referring to the cross. He's talking about Christ's crucifixion and the resulting glorification. Jesus is saying, because of what's coming at the cross, I'm going to do away with the temple. It's not going to be the location that's important. You, you're missing it, Jesus says. God is spirit and truth, and because because of who the Spirit is, if you want to worship Him, you must worship in spirit and truth. It's not the location that's important. It's who you are as a person. And you're living in sin. Stop worrying about the location. Jesus is driving right to the heart of the issues here. What's going on for this woman, right? She's so thirsty. She's asking for living water. She thinks it'd be great to not have the well to drink water anymore. But Jesus is driving at a deeper thirst. 
There's something that she's hungry for in these relationships with men, the acceptance, the approval. And Jesus says, it's speaking to your true thirst. Let's deal with that first. It's tied up in the aspect of worship. I've shared this for you bef- with you before, but it's been several years. It's worth reminding ourselves. Uh, when you think about worship, what is taking place? Worship is not just what we do here this morning on Sundays at 9 o'clock, right? Paul Tripp has some very helpful statements about worship that's just very, very helpful for us to think about. Worship is first your identity before it's ever your activity. That's one of the things that he says that's helpful. Worship is first your identity before it's ever your activity. What is he pointing at there? right? This woman is all interested in the activity of worship. Do we worship here or do we worship over there? I want to get the activity of worship right. But when you study human beings across all of society and all of time, it is not just people who go to buildings that are worshipers. All human beings are worshipers. By our very nature, you don't divide human beings into those that do and don't worship. The only difference for all of us is the object of our worship, right? And some come to buildings to worship, and others go to work to worship, to amass paychecks, to amass influence, to amass status. This woman has tried five different relationships in worship, looking for fulfillment, And Jesus is saying, listen, if you're going to worship, you need to worship in spirit and in truth. Well, how about you? Do you realize you are a worshiper? And you may think that because you came into this building this morning, that somehow that's okay between you and God. That that's going to, now I have worshipped. No, Worship is first your identity before it's ever your activity. And just as God is spirit and truth, we worship in spirit and in truth. What's true of our souls, our identities? Where do we find our truest longing and meaning? Is it in relationships? Is it in jobs? Is it in status? Is it in financial success? The money in a bank account? Is it in always being right? If you worship always being right, never being wrong, it will come out in your thoughts, your attitudes, your actions, your words to others. If you worship being successful and having others think well of you, It will dictate the way you spend your life and the way you spend your paycheck and the way the number of hours you put in so that that paycheck gets bigger. If you worship and value acceptance and relationship in the eyes of man, you will pursue it in places that can never satisfy cisterns that are broken and cannot hold water. And Jesus says, you want want water that will satisfy your thirst? Worship in spirit and truth. Because this debate that's been going on for centuries between Jews and Samaritans about the location, wrong debate. The one you're worshiping is here. That hour has come. And at his cross and crucifixion, you will see it most clearly. So here's the question for you and I. Do you worship him? Will you come to him? Is he the one alone that that satisfies your deepest longings and desires? Have you realized that you need to turn from your sins and place your faith and trust in Christ and that that, you're not doing that just so that you will get in heaven someday. You're doing that so that now the desires of your heart and life and what you worship gets a total makeover, a total reorientation so that the way we live our lives now completely changes so that we aren't living in shackled service to filling up broken wells that will never satisfy. If that's you this morning, in slave filling bucket after bucket into a broken will that will never never be filled, come to Christ. Turn from your sin. Realize he's the truest one that can satisfy that thirst. Let's go to him in prayer.